Front Fridays. We have our first guest today, Julie Shuprai. She is a good friend and she is also a very accomplished author and researcher of local history. You have published two books prior to this one, but you got a brand new book out. So her previous books, Edgewood Resort, A Place Apart, and she has also done a, a collection of letters by Libby Custer, who was the wife of George, right? Yes. George Custer. Um, she had family and a lot of connections up here. So we have that collection by that was edited by Julie. But your new book is what we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. Jens Peterson, a biography. <laughs> so tell us about Jens. Oh, Jens was uh, started out his career in Traverse City as a bricklayer. His father came from Denmark and he learned the trade of bricklaying. And when they were building the state hospital, his father came and was a, um, a, a what would you call, he was the, one of the head bricklayers. Okay. And so as the state hospital went up, uh, Jens learned how to be a bricklayer. Nice. So, but as, uh, he, as he got older, he decided it wasn't enough of a career for him. So he wanted to become an architect. So, in 1901, he went to Chicago and spent three years there and came back in 1904 with his license in architecture. How difficult was it to get a license then, would you say? Uh, it, was, it was unusual. There were only three states that required licensing at the time. Michigan was not one of them. Oh. So he was licensed in Illinois. So he came to Michigan as a licensed architect, which was pretty rare at the time. Nice. Cool. Why does Jens deserve a biography? Because, you know, small town, uh, small town architect, why does he deserve a biography of his own? Um, as I started researching him, the more I learned, the more interesting it became. So one thing led to another, and as I discovered all the different buildings that he designed, um, I figured his story needed to be told. So he was bringing new techniques and new products to architecture in Traverse City, and things he designed were different than what had been done in the previous 20 years. Neat. So, so uh, take us on a tour through Traverse City. What's a couple of buildings that people would want to look for that are Jens? Uh, buildings that are still standing. Um, is the, the old CSPS Hall, which is now a lawyer's office, is on the corner of, I think it's Oak and West Front Street. Um, the Antrim County Courthouse still stands. That was one of his first buildings in Traverse oh, wow. City. It's a lot of residences. Um, in one block on 6th Street, there are uh, four or five Peterson design houses. Wow. Was, a, was he a, a proponent of a particular design, or did he do a little bit of everything? Um, what were his favorite things to build, maybe? In his early career, he was still designing um, things that were in keeping with the architectural styles at the time. But by the 19-teens, he was designing bungalows, which was new to Traverse City. There weren't any other architects that were designing bungalows. Oh, cool. And there are examples, several examples of very nice Peterson design bungalows still in Traverse City. Yeah. Was it, uh, it was pretty unique for him. He had plan books that you could purchase um, and that sort of thing that were of his own design. So if you wanted to copy his work, other architects could take it or other builders could take it and, uh, and move on with that. Was he pretty successful in that venture, selling his plans? Yes, he was very successful. He had plan books starting from about 1908 um, until about 1918. Um, you could order his plan books and there were 50 or so plans that you could choose from, ranging from more affordable to a little more expensive houses. And you would write to him and he would send you all the things that you needed for your house, all the, the, the plans and the specifics and the cost of, of lumber and everything that, would, that you would need. Um, he 
did uh, copyright some of his plans so that other architects couldn't oh, yeah. steal his all of his plans. So his most popular plans he copyrighted. Wise. So, yep. Yeah. Okay, so there's a lot in here, obviously, for historians of architecture and preservationists and that sort of thing. Uh, what would the general reader enjoy about this book? Um, I think it's an interesting look at what was happening in Traverse City at the time. Um, things, his personality was was very unique. He was popular. Um, he was involved in a lot of community activities and fraternal organizations and um, so he was well known and um, it's interesting to, to, to learn about his personality. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you're a regular contributor to a local magazine called the Grand Traverse Journal. Yes. It's uh, gtjournal.tattle.org. Um, <laughs> And uh, so you, yeah, you've submitted several articles about Jens. One in particular, my very, it's probably my most favorite thing that we've <laughs> ever published is this fantastic letter that we presume he wrote to the Record Eagle. And it was all about fudge. Could you tell yes. us about the fudge? <laughs> the, uh, Jens Peters, one of his hobbies was writing. And so I, I think this was probably something that he wrote for, uh, to submit to the newspaper. But it was about a couple of young girls who, I don't know why they were making fudge in the State Bank building, but his <laughs> office was in the State Bank building. And all of the, the gentlemen who had offices in the, in the building um, smelled the fudge that was baking. And they, all, and they all came down <laughs> to the lower level where they were, these ladies were making the fudge. And, um, they they left for some reason, like I guess to let it cool. And then when they came back, someone had absconded with the fudge. <gasps> no. And so it was a uh, a fun little article about who nailed the fudge. <laughs> <laughs> and back then, nailed was a slang term for stealing, yes. not for what we use it for yeah, right. today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, what a uh, so this guy was pretty hilarious. Mm -hmm. He had a lot, um, he did a lot in social circles. He also had a family. Yes. And uh, eventually he moved from Traverse City, right? Yes. Um, his entire family, his, his parents lived here and his, uh, his younger brother was also a brick mason, but he uh, took a job out in Sacramento in 1907. So their parents and Jens's brother Henry all moved out to Sacramento about 1907. So in 1919, after the World War, the economy slowed down. Um, people weren't building anything at the time. Um, California was an incredible opportunity. It was growing like crazy. Mm -hmm. So he packed up his family and moved to Sacramento, where the rest of his family was. So a good part of this book takes place in Traverse City, a good part of it takes place in Sacramento, California. Yes. Um, and then there's a lot of humor, there's a little bit of scandal, there's all sorts of awesome things in here, and it's really a, the slice of life of yep. uh, a family living in 19-teens Traverse mm -hmm. City. Yes, it is. Julie, you've done fantastic work. I know Jen, Jens is like the love of your life. Yep. If he was alive, <laughs> he'd be the love of your life. Yep. Um, Ten years in the making. Thank you so much for coming, Julie. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Let's welcome our second guest today, Beth Bynum. Beth is fanta a fantastic artist, and we are really excited to have her here today. In fact, she has a show. So if you like Beth and you like art, you should come this evening. It's going to be at the Grand Traverse Distillery from 6 to 8 o'clock uh, tonight, Friday, November 17th. Right. Beth, thank you so much for coming today. Thank you for having me. Yeah. It's great. So, an artist. You, are, you have done a myriad of different mediums. Uh, you've gotten into digital collage lately, but collage is really sort of, is that really where you feel like you found your voice? Collage is the start, and yeah. that's uh, most everything that I do has collage in it. Whether it's uh, tissue paper, or it's painted paper, antique paper, okay. mostly everything has some sort of paper in it. Okay. Uh, I, I own a Bynum. I'm a proud owner of a Bynum. Uh, and yes, there's paper in it. Uh, uh, you used um, some 
uh, vintage sheet music in mine. Absolutely. And it's gorgeous. Yes. I love looking at mine. It's right on my mantle. It's it's the prime. It's in prime location. Right. Thanks. Um, yeah. So uh, you sell your art, obviously, because I, I bought do. some. I do. Um, you're going to be selling some tonight at tonight's show, yes. so come on down. Um, so in collage, uh, what do you find about collage that really speaks to you? Like what? How did you get started, maybe, in collage? Well, I love paper, and uh, I'm always looking for paper. Uh, pa paper just comes to me. Um, someone might find some paper and say, hey, I've been thinking about you, and um, they give it to me, and so I just start in. And I paint my own paper. I stamp paper, um, and that's how I, I find things. Well, things find me. <laughs> It's nice to have a good network of friends that oh, know you're oh, an yes, artist, right? Oh, yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, oh, cool. Uh, how long have you been doing art? I've been doing art for about six years oh. uh, since I retired. Okay. And um, gone from just doing uh, newspaper and magazine collages to uh, digital collage. Oh, wow. Photography. So, yeah, how do you use paper in a digital? Um, well, I might take a picture of something that I did um, with paper in it mm -hmm. and use that. But mostly digital is with my iPhone okay. and I uh, manipulate Neat. the photo. That sounds like wicked fun. It is. It so, is. I love it. Do you have it. any of that uh, in tonight's show? Any of your digital work? Tonight's show does not have digital. Okay. It's a retrospective of what I started out with and what I've been doing lately. Um, I started out very small. The first uh, piece that I have there is called Postcard from Iagra, and it's a little five by seven, and it has uh, fake stamps in it. Oh. So uh, Iagra is actually uh, part of geography because it comes from National Geographic, <laughs> and I cut out this little Iagra and made some fake stamps, which wow. I love to do. Yeah. Fake stamps, and so that's in there. Fun. What was, what's going to be your favorite piece tonight? Uh, my favorite piece is Rust Angel, yeah. and it's a box assemblage. Uh, it has um, all kinds of rust, which I also love besides paper. Uh, I love rust, and rust does just come to me. Um, I find it while I'm walking down the street, and my son is always saying, Mom, what are you doing? And I'm saying, I'm looking for rust. And um, it, it just happens. <laughs> it happens. Uh, rust Angel is uh, a group of all kinds of rust. It's in a long, thin box, and um, it also has a poem uh, on the inside of it about angels. And um, it's one of my latest, and it's really one of my favorites. Yeah, yeah. You have uh, you put poetry uh, in in not a lot of your pieces, but I've seen a couple. Um, and in fact, on the one that I purchased, on the back side is just a little snippet of a poem. Uh, is poetry something that you do also? Is that, uh, or do you find poetry like you find your rest? I really enjoy poetry. I uh, think that it's such a wonderful creative endeavor and that brings us to what's going on tonight mm -hmm. with um, the poetry that's oh. the um, I invited uh, poets from the Bayside Poet Group oh. uh, and I have four people who have written poems that go with my artwork and uh, they will be reading their poems from uh, six to seven so it's a not only an art show but it's a poetry reading which I'm really excited about. Oh, that is such a cool idea. And you know, Beth, you have, for a long time, you are known in our community as being someone who encourages other artists. Uh, you have done many, many programs out at the Kingsley Branch Library, encouraging people to develop their skills in collage. You've helped them, you know, make books. You've done all sorts of really cool things. People who wouldn't consider themselves artists, you have reached out to. Um, and then tonight you're dealing with artists, other you know poets, right? Uh, and encouraging them to be a big part of that. So I wanted to thank you for doing that. Oh, that really means a lot. I I love it. Yeah. I love it. I 
I'm just, I am truly amazed at what comes out of people's brains. Yeah. And um, when I look at the picture, I mean, there's something that I'm trying to say, but when other people are looking at it and they write a poem about it, it's, it's very, very interesting. Oh, yeah. Really powerful. Yes, it is. So we're coming down to the end of our time. Tell us about what you've got in front oh, of you here. <laughs> I brought some little examples of collage pieces, um, and maybe you can see it, but or maybe you can't, but a lot of this is paper. Mm -hmm. It's cut out paper, mm -hmm. it's mark making, it's tissue, and I'm making a series of these little blocks for a new uh, price point for people to be able to buy without spending a lot of money. So I'm, these are just some examples. I mean, that would be adorable. I could see somebody having a series tucked into a wall with other art and really right. like building a layer, collaging with your collage, basically. There you go, That's collaging with my, oh, yeah, yeah. Creative. Right. Thanks, yeah, we'll Amy. See. I'm working, I'll work, <laughs> I'll work on that idea and I'll market it, right? There you go, Amy. Um, Great. So, <laughs> so, yeah, tell me, um, so we have tonight's show. Are you yes. doing any other showings uh, coming up? Um, I will be at, uh, in the summer, I will be at Elizabeth Oliver okay. in Frankfurt with two other ladies in June and July. It will be a, a group show. And uh, I'll be at in Glen Arbor for a show there. And uh, I'm always in yeah. some show. Yeah, and you are around, so. <laughs> Um, so, right. Thank you so much for coming, Beth, tonight. Don't forget, Grand Traverse Distillery, 6 to 8 o'clock. This is part of the Art Mixer Mentor Series. Absolutely. And we're really celebrating you and your work, uh, your lifetime of work here. So thank well, you so thank much you. for coming. Thank Beth you Bynum. so much. Thank you. All right. Thanks for coming back with us. We have our third guest for today, Robert Downs. Robert is a seasoned author, several books under your belt. But your latest is what we're talking about today, Wendigo Moon. Yes, uh, very happy to be here. I'm yeah. honored to be on your show, Amy. Thank you. And uh, just to tell you a bit about my book, it's set 400 years ago among the uh, Native Americans of uh, northern Michigan and Canada. And uh, I'll tell you the plot in a, in a nutshell. Uh, it's set during the, um, the very tumultuous uh, century of the 1500s which the uh, historians tell us was, is called the lost century because there was such uh, uh, an immense amount of anarchy and upheaval for Native Americans during this century. And in my uh, book, a young woman's village is destroyed by tribal warfare. She's abducted and made the concubine of an enemy tribe. And she's then rescued by a young Ojibwe youth whose own village is destroyed by diseases introduced by foreign explorers. Mm -hmm. So together, at a very young age, they have to lead their people forward through this devastating time of, uh, you know, introduced diseases and the onset of the Little Ice Age of the 1600s. And it spans 31 years in the life of this Ojibwe couple. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow, that sounds like it'd be really fascinating. So tell me, um, tell me what inspired this particular work. How did you come to That's this That's an story interesting line? story. Um, I'm going to take you all the way back to my birth. I'm ready. Uh, <laughs> I lived on uh, I, the first couple years on my grandfather's farm outside Grand Rapids in Rockford. Well, in the 1940s, my dad plowed up like uh, scores of arrowheads and spear points and and you know, axe heads mm -hmm. and, and tools. And it turned out there had been an Ottawa village near the farm and they used to walk through the, the uh, farm through on their way to Grand Rapids. Well, I grew up believing that there were many, many more Native Americans in, in uh, North America than we can begin to imagine because of this. Okay. So I've always been fascinated by the Native Americans and I grew up reading every book I could about them and uh, about 25 years ago, just for, just for fun, I wrote this story about um, an Ojibwe uh, father who was try desperate to feed his family during a terrible winter, and he was pursued by a mortal enemy. Well, I put that story aside, 
started Northern Express Weekly, mm -hmm. spent 22 years doing that. We sold the paper, and then I got to wondering, whatever happened to that old warrior? And so I decided, I wanted to know who he loved, who his family was, who his clan was. So again, I wrote two more stories, just sort of in a, almost in a trance, you know, they just came to me. And then, long story to wind up here, <laughs> my daughter told me that the art prize in Grand Rapids was having a, a writing contest. So I sent this, one of these new stories in, and it won first prize, you know, in an international writing contest. So that story became the first <laughs> chapter in the book, okay. and the old story became the last chapter in the book, oh. and I went to live in the 1500s with these people for a year and a half, wow. and fell in love with the characters. Yeah. Yeah. How do you research something like that? Where I, do you go? I read about 50 books on the Ojibwe, also known as the Chippewa or the Anishinaabek, and, and Native America. But I also, because this takes place before the arrival of the white man, uh, I also uh, read a lot of books about anthropology by the likes of Napoleon Chagnon. Uh, because in the 1500s, um, even though these uh, European explorers were maybe a thousand miles away, uh, the country uh, was uh, flooded with the likes of viral hepatitis, measles, smallpox, typhus, and this swept across uh, North America and South America too. Mm. And the historians tell us that somewhere between 50 and 90 percent of all Native Americans died in this century. Wow. So, um, I forgot the question now. No, uh, how did you... Um Whoa, I forgot the question, too, so we're two peas in a pod. We're on the same page, so to speak. <laughs> but yeah, so, um, but basically, how, do you, how did you start doing this research was oh, the yeah. endless question. Well, in addition to uh, reading all of these books, I mentioned reading anthropology, mm -hmm. so I'd get the ideology of, uh, say, measles, how measles affects primitive peoples in South America. Uh, I, I studied how, uh, you know, maybe how warfare is conducted in New Guinea, Africa, oh, okay. uh, South America, to get a sense of what prehistoric life might have been like. And then I also read extensively the accounts of the voyageurs and the Jesuit fathers of New France who wrote a great deal about the uh, life in Native America in the early 1600s. But you can't get everything out of a book. So I also have backpacked and hiked every major trail in Michigan. I've winter camped many times, including on the shores of Lake Superior, because I think you have to have visceral experiences as well. You know, it's not just enough good enough to just read books. Right. You gotta feel the cold they felt and, and see what the wilderness is like in the middle of the winter. You know? Oh yeah, especially yeah. when you're talking about having such a love for these characters. Of course, you, you want to be as close to them as you can. And since Absolutely. you can't hang out with them, you might as well be where they were. Absolutely. And okay. speaking of characters, yes. I might mention um, there's as many characters in this book as a Russian novel. <laughs> you, you can see there's principal <laughs> characters, but I want to tell you there's really only four main characters. Okay. Good, good. There's Ozawashkwa Ashagi, who means Blue Heron. There's Misko Makwa, he's Red Bear. Uh, Animi Malingan, he's He Who Outruns the Wolves. And Bejiko Nika, he's Goose. So you, when you read this book, you really have to refer to that glossary of names and then to the, uh, the map. Because it starts out um, up in Thunder Bay area, mm -hmm. Kakabeka Falls in Ontario winds its way over to the Mississippi headwaters, back to Grand Island in the Upper Peninsula, and the book finishes right here at Sleeping Bear National Lakeshore at Otter Creek. And that's an homage to um, where I live, because we have a cottage out near there. Nice. Yeah. So, you mentioned the ending. Yeah. Before we came on camera, you mentioned that this ending is getting people. I, Don't give it away. I have read, I have cried my eyes out a dozen times at this ending because I love the characters so much. 
I had someone else write online that she felt the same way. Mm. It's a very spiritual ending, and uh, but some people are, are totally shocked by it, I hope in a good way, and because um, uh, like I have a friend who says he can always predict the end of a book. He totally couldn't, you know, oh. my brother couldn't. I'm, I, I would just only say nothing about it. So you say, gotta yeah, read the say book. Say nothing about it. Thank you so much, Bob. Thank you, you were Amy. fantastic. Thank you. You're fantastic too. <laughs> <laughs>